So there are four major impactful adjustments with food. First one that can have a huge impact is to reduce the amount of fried food in restaurants that you eat. Now you might say, well, I don't eat fried food that often, but a lot of people eat fried food. Now fried food is not bad if you have it in a place that is using the right oil and doesn't have a lot of flour that's processed or wheat or bleached flour. That's a big difference. If you use the right oil and you use almond flour or coconut flour or other kind of flour, completely different. You can fry food, but they don't do that in restaurants. So not eating fried food in a restaurant is just one kind of rule, if you will, to say, I just don't eat fried food in restaurants. I just don't do it. The reason why is important to know. So restaurants way back in the day when they told us saturated fat was bad for us and caused heart disease, which there's actually no proof that's ever proved that to be true, they changed the oils in restaurants to go from lard to vegetable oils which is one of the worst things they could have ever done. Vegetable oils are not stable when heated at high temperatures. The other problem is they are heated over 100 times a day. Think about it, they don't change that oil. So that oil is in that fryer and they are heating it over and over and over again. It is so rancid and has so many free radicals which are connected to cancer and aging and inflammation that when you eat that stuff, you have so much rancid chemicals and free radicals, it is so destructive to the body. So I'm telling you that if you eat fried food, including French fries in restaurants, uh, that is exactly fried food. Anything fried. It is typically fried pretty much all the time. Expect high-end restaurants that have figured out how to still use lard or cooking oil that's actually from an animal. So this is a thing to think about. And this is where we realize, wait, that is an adjustment that can have a huge impact. Now, I know you might say, well, wait a minute, I like French fries. I get that. They are really high in carbohydrates. But the point is, have them at home. If you're going to have them, bake a certain amount that you can actually control the, the size that you're doing instead of being tempted to overeat it. Plus, it's not going to be fried in rancid oil. And I can tell you one thing that really was clear to me when I got off fried food, Food. And I didn't eat that stuff. Now, remember, I ate fried food like twice a day. I was a fast food junkie. I mean, I would say I ate it two to three times a day. So I'm not talking about someone that doesn't understand that the flavor of it's enjoyable when you first get it. But I remember when I started to really focus on not eating fried food. And then when I got it out of my body, I went and I had French fries one time and I didn't, I hadn't had them in a long time. I got the worst leg cramps in the middle of the night. Oh my goodness. I woke up in a terror of like literally knives stabbing into my leg. And I'm like, what the heck is that? The only thing different I did was I had French fries at a fast food restaurant. And I can tell you that it is those rancid oils that did that. So, and I tested it again. I'm not kidding. Like three months later, same exact thing happened. So this is where after I've been off of it for a long time, you actually notice these changes and what it does to your body. People do not decide their future. They decide their habits and their habits decide their future because your future, what you're going to get in life will be dictated by the habits that you live on a daily basis. So the second thing is to Reduce processed foods with trans fats, and I'm going to show you what to look for. Now, they did take this out of foods, but sometimes you can still see it in there. So you want to know what you're looking for, and I'm going to show you that on some labels. So getting processed foods out that have partially hydrogenated oils, but also even if it's not partially hydrogenated, you want to not have canola oil, soybean oil, or vegetable oils. And I'm going to show you where to look for this on your labels. Now, most dressings are vegetable oil or canola oil or soybean oil. So don't buy any dressings that that's the base. I always find dressings that have avocado oil or olive oil as their base. You just don't want to have vegetable or canola or soy because it's just not as good for our bodies. So this is an example on a label. See how it says trans fat zero? That says that there's zero grams of trans fat in this label. But yet on the ingredient, it says there's partially hydrogenated vegetable oil, which is trans fats and hydrogenated oils. Huh. Interesting. 
Okay, well, you say there's zero because they don't have to document a certain amount. So that's why you want to look at ingredients. Now, this is obviously a garbage piece of food. Look at the ingredients. Enriched flour, no good. Sugar, no good. Partially hydrogen of vegetable oil, no good. Hydrogenated oils and then soy something. That was probably some, you know, just label I got off the, the internet to show you an example. Another one is, this is margarine. See how it says the First ingredient is liquid soybean oil. No, oh, that is not the healthiest thing to put in our body. It's so much better to have butter. And then partially hydrogenated soybean oil, and then hydrogenated soybean oil, and then hydrogenated cottonseed oil. But look at the top, it says trans fat zero. Huh, interesting. Did you know that margarine is one ingredient away from plastic? Mm, yeah, wow. Okay. Yeah, no, it can't believe it's not butter. It's not. It's almost plastic. So that's where we go. Wait a minute. I need to be looking at my labels here. So we're going to do a little food knowledge quiz. Ready? So I want you to tell me how many calories and how many grams of carbs do you think are in a nacho bel grande a Taco Bell? So how many calories do you think are in a nacho bel grande? You think, okay, a nacho bel grande is a gigantic plate of nachos and cheese and sour cream and beef and all this stuff. So I'm asking you to guess because I, wanna, I want you to test your own knowledge. Like, wow, how many calories is in a nacho bel grande? I have no idea. This is why we want to educate ourselves in understanding what are we actually really eating. Well, it actually has dun, 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 740 calories and 82 grams of carbs. 82. That is a lot of carbs, just so you know. To eat that in one meal is a guaranteed way to spike your blood sugar and get diabetes, type 2 diabetes, if you do that on a consistent basis. Now, you might say, well, that's 740 calories isn't that much in a meal. Yeah, but if you're only supposed to eat 1,500 roughly, that's half your day. So let's look at Chick-fil-A, a chicken sandwich meal with medium fries and a Diet Coke. So this number, I'm telling you, doesn't even have a regular Coke, which would have added another 200 calories. Has 830 calories. Now you might say, oh, but it's a Christian company and they don't work on Sundays. Yeah, that's all nice and all, but it doesn't mean they're feeding us healthy food and everything that they're doing. So the goal is to say, well, wow, how many calories? 830 calories and 90 grams of carbs. That is a ton. That is a medium French fry. That is not even a large with a soda. The average fast food meal at a restaurant, just so you know, with a drink, fries, and a burger or, you know, a chicken, whatever, fried sandwich is about 1,500 calories. And they say that you should have about 1,500 to 2,000 based on your activity level and your weight. So I want you to get to where you start looking up what you eat on the internet. And I'm going to show you how to do this because you don't want to eat something, like I said in the very beginning, that you don't know the nutrition of. Don't blindly eat something and go, I don't know what's in that. Look it up. It takes you 30 seconds. So go online. If you eat French fries at a fast food restaurant, look up the fast food restaurant name, Nutrition Large Fries, and you will see it right there. So the large fry typically has about 500 calories and 65 grams of carbs. And remember, fried. So this is fried in the rancid oil that we're talking about. That's just in the French fries, 500. That is a third of your calories right there for the day. A small has 220 and 29 grams of carbs. So you might say, well, can I still eat the French fries? Well, if you start to make small adjustments, why don't you go down to a medium and then do that and then go down to a small? And you might say, well, that's not enough. Well, if you eat one at a time or a couple at a time, you can eat them slow and actually eat half the calories and half the damage to your body. So if you're not going to stop eating fast food in a restaurant, at least reduce the amount you eat. So the average person wastes about $5 a day on junk food, sugar, things that are just, you know, just stuff you're like, really did I need to eat that? About $5 a day. That is $150 a month. And that is $1,800 a year wasted on fast food and junk food and things that we just kind of eat here and there that are just like, oh, really did I need to eat that? 
We say we don't have money to invest in our health or healthier food, but yet we're wasting money in all these other places. Over 10 years, that's $18,000. Over 20 years, it's $36,000. This is where we look at it and go, oh, wait a minute. That couple dollars a day does add up. In John 10, 10, it talks about the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come to give you life abundantly to the full. That's not just eternity. That is also on this earth. There are so many scriptures that refer to the abundant life that we live on this earth, being happy and healthy and whole, living in joy and peace. That is abundance. So I want to ask you to ask yourself, where is the enemy stealing from you? Are you tired? Are you groggy? Or do you not feel good? Do you have low self-esteem? Do you have depression? Just not happy? Isolated? You don't sleep well? I mean, these are important things to start asking ourselves. Where are we getting stolen from? Where are our lives being impacted from not making healthy choices and thinking it doesn't matter. Yes, it matters. It affects every area of our life when we don't eat well, every area. And you don't realize that until you actually eat better. Because then when you start to eat well and clean, all of a sudden you'd be like, man, I feel amazing. I'm so mentally clear. I sleep amazing. I, I, I just, I can't even believe how confident I feel. I feel so happy all the time. I feel so stable. It's totally different. I have no cravings. How did this happen? Well, it's called feeding our body good food that our bodies are designed to eat, not foods that are destructive that cause more issues. So this is where you find that balance. And trust me, when you eat clean and you start to eat better and you don't have all these side effects, if you do eat something that you used to eat, you will feel it big time. I mean, I'm talking, you will go, whoa, I had no idea that food was doing that to me. But when you're eating it all the time, you don't even notice as much. So ask yourself this question as well. What am I risking if I don't take action and get healthy? Heart disease is the number one killer in America. Higher chances of cancer, type two diabetes, Alzheimer's disease, the quality of life, even if you don't get a disease, what about how you feel every morning? How do you, how do you wake up out of bed? This is all connected to the food that we eat. Fulfilling the plan that God has for your life. If you're not healthy, then you're not going to be able to live a longer life full of vigor and vitality and be able to fulfill the plan that God has for you. I don't know how many times pastors have to step down from the pulpit because they don't have health anymore or they die in their 60s. That happens all the time. So when we think about, we realize like, wow, how is the enemy stealing from our destiny, from our future, from our ability to actually go out there and fulfill the things God has for our life? And when you realize this, you realize that you'll end up paying way more money for not taking care of your health than you do for taking care of your health. That's why when you do your budget, you need to make sure in your budget, you are budgeting health. Are you taking vitamins? Do you have a gym membership that you're using? Are you investing in programs that can help you be healthy? If you don't see that in your budget, then this is where you wanna reanalyze and go, wait a minute, I'm actually not investing in my health in that area. So with the four impactful adjustments with food, the third thing is to be careful how many very high calorie meals that has high carbs and high fat and protein. So when you combine high carb with high fat, that is a massive problem. You can have high fat meals if you're not having high carb meals. So that's where the whole keto realm came in where people were eating lots of fat. But the problem is when they get used to eating all that fat, and they start going back to their old ways of carbohydrates, oh, now this is why they pack on the weight like crazy because now they add all those carbs back in and they're still used to eating all that fat. That is a massive guarantee to gain a ton of weight. So the point is, the concept is to keep your, your mindset of how can I actually eat in a way that is a concept of eating. You don't ever typically want to combine really high carbs with really high fat. So if you are going to have a higher carb meal, you want to actually not have a ton of fat in it. So again, how do you know? You got to look up the labels. You got to learn a little bit about nutrition and see what that is. 
So that is really the most damaging aspect of traditional pizza. So pizza does not mean it's bad uh, in itself, but it's the ingredients on it. It's usually enriched wheat flour that's been bleached and all the nutrients have been sucked out. They put it back in because they call it enriched because they had to bleach it out and put it back in. So that's what bleached enriched flour is. That's usually the flour. So it's full of that. Then it's also full of carbohydrates. And then you pack on the fat with the cheese and the beef and all that stuff. That's why pizza is so dangerous. If you can remove the carbs and the flour, you can have the higher fat with the cheese and the meats and all of that stuff. I eat cauliflower pizza crust. Love it. You got to find a good one though, because some of them are gross. So I love cauliflower pizza crust. And I also have an almond flour one. So I enjoy pizza. I just know that if I have a regular pizza, my blood sugar is going to go through the roof. I remember I was out traveling and normally I'm very particular about that kind of stuff. And I had bought this pizza that I was like, you know what? I'm at an Airbnb. I was, it was fast. I didn't have a lot of time to go to the restaurants or grocery store or anything like that. And I just kind of grabbed something. I don't, don't do that normally. I just don't. So I grabbed this pizza. I'm like, you know what? I haven't had that in a while. I'm just going to do it. And I just grab it. But I have a blood sugar tester. So I'm like, wait a minute. When I got back to the Airbnb, I'm like, whoa, this is kind of high in carbs. I'm, but I'm like, I don't eat this stuff very often. I'm just going to have it. But I checked my blood sugar before and after I ate it. Oh my goodness. In two hours, my blood sugar jumped to 210. That is insane. I could not believe it. It normally ever jumps that high. So, I mean, for me, that is extremely high. I think that's very high for anybody. That's really where the issue with pizza comes in, that it's all of that together that it causes the biggest issue. The fourth adjustment to make is to focus on how much sugar you consume in the quantities in one sitting, but also over time. So remember I talked about in the beginning, the adjustments that you can make that can impact your nutrition. Without focusing on a bunch of little details and specifics, you are focusing on the concept. So you're learning like, okay, wait, how can I adjust these things? So the other thing with the sugar though, is it's really noticing how much sugar am I actually consuming? This is a game changer. You might think, well, I don't really eat a lot of sugar. Well, do you really? Have you actually ever tracked it? They actually started adding on the nutrition labels, the word total added sugar. I'm glad that they started doing this because this wasn't there years ago. And it actually does help a little bit because it helps you know the added sugar in the actual food. Now, the interesting part is the FDA says you shouldn't consume more than 50 grams of added total sugars a day. Hmm. Well, you look at those labels, you can hardly eat anything that has under 50 grams of total added sugar. Start looking at it. I dare you. You will be like, what? How is this even possible? Like in the normal processed food. So if the Food and Drug Administration is telling us to not eat more than 50 grams of total added sugar a day, which I am amazed that they have even were able to put that on the labels with the amount of lobbyists that are involved with controlling sugar in our food supply. So that's a whole nother topic. So the point is, is that if they're telling us that, then I just encourage you to start looking at that and at least start tracking it. There's a movie called The Sugar Film, and this guy was off sugar, I believe, for three years. And he went back and wanted to do a a documentary about what would happen to his body if he ate about 50 grams of added sugars a day, just 50 grams. And I think it was closer to 40. So what did I say that the FDA said that we need to uh, not consume more of? Again, it's a good guide, but this guy did it for about two months and his body went through so many medical changes that the doctor tried to get him to stop the experiment. He was starting to show signs of fatty liver disease in only four weeks. So it's just so interesting. He did not eat blatant sugar and desserts and sodas. He ate regular things like yogurts and cereals and and because he wanted to prove that we are eating these things and we don't even realize what it's doing to our body and how much we're consuming. So one first thing to start doing in that area is to start look at how many total added sugars am I consuming and 
what is that amount in the whole day? So in a meal, but also in a whole day. That would be a phenomenal place to start, is to start looking at the labels and adding that up in a day. I dare you to do it. You're going to be amazed when you start to see that. Now, obviously, if something doesn't have a label, then you would have to look it up on the internet, like a half pint of raspberries. So I want you to write this website down. It's called fatsecret.com, F-A-T secret.com. That is my favorite website to go search any food that you can think of. Even if you're like, what's in a half, a half of an onion? I don't know. Go look it up. It's in there. I mean, I know, but I'm just saying you may not know. Go look it up because you'll be able to find every food you can think of, even all the restaurant foods. That, that site is a game changer. I did that for so many years. So when it comes to sugar, the amount of sugar that we consume, specifically in America, I believe is a foundational reason of why this country is where it is. Now, I understand people have food choices. I understand there's so many more elements involved. There's fast food and overeating and alcohol and all these other issues. But when you look at the biggest change in our nation since 1950s, sugar consumption is a huge aspect of that. Another thing I would recommend that you do is watch a movie called Fat Head, F-A-T-H-E-A-D. It explains why we are where we are, what happened with what I was talking about with saturated fat earlier, why they came and said, oh, saturated fat causes heart disease, although there was no proof whatsoever. There was even a study from the government, a hundred million dollar study that they had to shut down because they could not prove that saturated fat caused heart disease. So this is where we have to educate ourselves because we are sometimes being told things that there's actually no proof of that. And it depends where that information is coming from. So this is why we want to look at it. God made animals. God actually made animals for us to consume. And he told us that we could consume them for food. Now, this is one thing to think about. Animals, saturated fat is in animals. So why would God tell us to consume a food and give us a food to eat that is not good for our bodies? That's not how God would set it up. So we have to look at that from that perspective and go, wait a minute, if God told us we can eat animals, then why are we not supposed to have saturated fat? So this is where you start to question these ideas. The amount of sugar that we're consuming on a daily basis and the amount of sugar in one sitting. So it's more so not just those isolated times, it's more so over periods of time. How often do you have it and how often do you eat it and what is it doing to your body? Most people can say that, yeah, I kind of feel anxious. I, I notice a difference. I, even though I enjoy the flavor while I'm doing it, I do notice that I feel more anxious and I, um, you know, a little bit more moody. And I can tell you, I know that not all depression is, you know, this foundation. And I'm not a doctor. I'm not making medical claims. I've just worked with tens of thousands of clients and I've seen this happen to them. They had depression. They got off sugar, depression gone. So, and I've seen it countless amounts of times. I just had another client. She was so chronically depressed, having suicidal thoughts, laying on her couch, eating sugar after sugar. I challenged her with that, said, look, you know, you might consider trying it for 30 days to see what happens. Bam, depression gone. No more depression. So that's where it's just interesting. And again, I'm not making medical claims that that's going to happen for anybody that does that. What I'm saying is if you're struggling with depression, you got to look at the food you're eating too. Don't just go on an antidepressant without doing that because it's so important. And talk to your doctor about that. That's a very serious decision to go on an antidepressant. And it frustrates me that doctors do not look at the nutrition in conjunction with that possibly and help you realize that maybe what you're eating is contributing to the depression. So that's just something to really consider because I've seen it time and time again for the clients that I've worked with. I don't let myself sit there and, oh, let me think about it. Let me lull it all over. I make myself take action because I know if I don't, I'm risking doing nothing. That is so common. So that's why I encourage people to take action because many times we're like, oh man, I just, I said I was going to do that thing and I never did. I said I was going to get healthier and I just didn't take it seriously. And all of a sudden, one day turns into a week, one week into a month, one month into a year, one year into a decade. And then you're like, whoa, wait a minute. How did that happen?